Hi everybody, welcome to our Game of Thrones Season 8 show, historical review. If you're catching this on YouTube, you can get the full conversation on the podcast. The links are below to whichever platform that you prefer. Hello, Dr. Rutger Voss. Hey Gil. So, it is completed. It is completed. It is done. It is done. It is not behind us. We want to make the most out of it. They give us lemons. We make lemonade. Mm. So you are a scientist, but a huge history buff. Yes. Okay, so Game of Thrones is over the show. We have two kingdoms. Bran is the king, Sansa is the queen in the north. We have been touting for years the historical process that was in in the story. The War of the Roses being the catalyst for the War of the Five Kings. And after the War of the Roses, yada yada yada. Absolute monarchy, the Elizabethan era, the golden age. Yada yada yada, United Kingdom. <laughs> so basically we thought all this history will be condensed into the story and according to game of thrones it is not no uh but what i thought thought was really weird is that uh, apparently it was all of a sudden an option to just step out of the union that was kind of <laughs> kind of a bold move of sansa to just drop out it was very easy did the other kings know that you could also just do a brexit that's a kind of bold after they learned that they could use that option None of them did. Yet. So far. Like they were sitting there in this council. The Dornish uh, prince didn't say, hmm, we also want independence. And Yara from the Iron Islands, who two seasons ago wanted independence, was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'll stay here. So this was kind of a a historical conclusion. So, okay, it doesn't have to be historical, right? But it was also kind of like apolitical. It wasn't really, didn't really make sense politically why just the North would just get to see just like that, just a nod with the king. Yeah. And then the other kingdoms would want to stay. Mind you, the Dornish and the Iron Islands do not even have representation in the small council of our favorite characters. It's really weird that that Sansa could get away with this. I mean, she's uh, undermining a brand's authority right away. This sort of sets the stage, actually, for a new War of the Roses, doesn't it? Uh, like the House of York and the House of Lancaster were actually two branches of the Plantagenets. And now the Starks are splitting into the North and the King's Landing uh, branch. Uh, the Plantagenets were uh, the royal house that ruled England during the late Middle Ages. Uh, for example, during the Hundred Years' War in France. Mm. Uh, those kings were all Plantagenets. Then when the Hundred Years' War ended, and England was sort of in, in disarray and in fiscal trouble. Then different branches of the Plantagenets uh, sp split up and went, went to war with each other uh, until eventually they were reunited again, sort of relabeled as the Tudors, I think. Before we continue about the political and historical uh, analysis. So yesterday I met with Noga, our dear friend. We were preparing for our three uh, summary videos of Game of Thrones. One of them was uh, trying to heal us, the viewers, try to understand our pain and psychoanalyze us. Another one is try to understand and psychoanalyze Dan and Dave, the show creators and showrunners. So in order to do that, we watched like a dozen or more interviews that they had over several different uh, periods of time. The beginning of the show, the middle of the show, at the end of the show. And what was so apparent to me and that I didn't really notice before, is that they know nothing about politics. When they talk about the story, they talk about the characters. For them, it's a, it's a world inhabited by characters. And when they were asked about a political issue, what political issue do they support? They were like, we are really against all the Hollywood types uh, speaking their mind about politics. It's kind of annoying which is the polar opposite of George R. R. Martin, whose formative life experience was being a conscientious objector in the war of Vietnam. And they so much don't understand politics 
that they were saying we do support the IRC, the International uh, Not Refugee Center, Rescue Center of Refugees. And they say this is not a political issue. This is beyond partisan and beyond politics. Oh, really? So, so they basically <laughs> they think that the issue of refugees in the U.S. is beyond politics and beyond the partisan bickering, which again shows they know nothing about politics. So they didn't even try to make the story conclude in a, in a, in a way they made political sense. They just had like this puzzle, I'm guessing. Each character, where does each character get? We have to get this character here, this character here, this character here, and it doesn't have to fit any political mold or historical process. Yeah, they, they needed to uh, tie up a bunch of loose ends and sort of complete uh, character arcs. And that's what they tried to do. So let's talk a little bit about, about historical processes. So the War of the Roses resulted, among other things, in the decline of feudalism for several reasons, like the lords basically killed each other, decimated their own power, their own numbers. And there was a rise also in the in the in the power of the of the peasants who could uh, and, and 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 the warriors wanted to get paid, not just to get called up to fight. Now the monarch Bran, he's not really a ruler. The yep. government is the ruler, the small council, yes. proto government, and he's whatever like a Paul Atreides, Dalai Lama kind of uh, god king. Leadery ceremonial king, ceremonial king that that has divine powers. Yeah, that's weird. The decline of feudalism around the time of the War of the Roses has, in part, to do with the I guess all the the warring that had been going on, and so all these houses being very depleted. But there were other things involved as well, like uh, the um, the Black Death, which had really decimate this isn't even the right term like uh, one third of the european population or something like that had died uh, and disproportionately the uh, peasants and so their labor was just needed so they could also argue for more rights than they had previously because they were in demand and could you find any parallel in the story for the black death let's say the white walkers coming in it's also contagious it killed a lot of people, mostly simple folk. Yeah. So it was also right there. Uh, there's a bunch of things that come together that allow us to place the story in time to try to fit what period George R. R. Martin must have been thinking about. So one is the War of the Roses, mm -hmm. the other is the decline of feudalism, and a third one is this completion of a conquest, in this case of all of Westeros, and in the same year, somebody setting out to sail west, <laughs> which reminded me enormously of the completion of the Reconquista in Spain uh -huh. in 1492, again, about the same time, the 15th century, right. and Columbus setting out to sail west. If you're uh, listening to this on YouTube, look in the description and go to any of these other platforms because that's just going to be much more convenient.